The sensors felt it first. While Wyoming slept under October stars, three dozen GPS receivers scattered across America's most famous wilderness began recording something extraordinary. Not the gentle rise and fall Earth's crust performs daily as tides pull at continents. This was different. Station Delta 7, bolted to bedrock near Fishing Bridge, measured its position shifting skyward at rates that triggered automated warnings across three university campuses and two federal agencies. By dawn, the pattern was undeniable. 17 monitoring stations confirmed simultaneous uplift radiating from a point beneath the lake's western arm. The ground had risen 13 centimeters in 14 hours. To understand why this matters, picture trying to lift the island of Manhattan three inches overnight. The forces required would be immense. Beneath Yellowstone, something with that kind of power had just flexed. October's uplift didn't stop. Day three brought another five centimeters. Day four, eight more. The mathematics were alarming. If Manhattan had risen three inches on Monday, by Thursday it would be standing a foot higher, and nobody would be debating whether something was wrong. Teams deployed portable equipment by helicopter. Rangers quietly closed backcountry trails. The Park Service faced an impossible balance. Warn without terrifying, prepare without panicking, and serve three million annual visitors. Geysers responded in their own language. Steamboat, which can throw boiling water higher than a skyscraper, but erupts on no predictable schedule, went off twice in 36 hours. That hadn't happened in recorded memory. Thermal pools changed color as subsurface plumbing shifted. At Norris Basin, new steam vents opened overnight. Sulfur smell strengthened. The system's surface expressions were shouting what instruments already knew. Deep forces were mobilizing. In West Yellowstone, a town that lives and dies by tourist traffic, hotel owners watched reservation cancellations stack up. National news had discovered the story. Supervolcano became a headline. Social media did what it does best, amplified anxiety beyond reason. Scientists held press briefings emphasizing the vast gap between unusual activity and imminent catastrophe, but nuance dies quickly online. The economic damage was real and immediate. The physical danger remained theoretical and distant. Which threat do you prepare for? Here's what likely happened. Assembled from the evidence. Deep below, a pulse of basaltic magma, hotter and more fluid than the rhyolite chamber above, pushed upward from the mantle source. It didn't reach the surface. It was probably never intended to, but it injected heat into overlying rock formations saturated with water, superheated groundwater already hovering near boiling. Temperature increase meant pressure increase. Pressure increase meant expansion. And expansion, when you're talking about cubic miles of fluid, means the ground rises. This is the conversation that never stops beneath volcanic systems. Magma supplies heat, water redistributes it, rock fractures under stress, and gas escapes where it can. Sometimes this conversation stays civil for centuries. Sometimes, as in October, it gets loud. The question facing scientists, would the conversation escalate to violence, or would the pressure find release through existing fractures and vents? The evidence could support either future. From orbit, synthetic aperture radar measured deformation with precision impossible a generation ago. Each satellite pass created an interference pattern comparing the ground's position to previous measurements. The resulting images looked like psychedelic fingerprints, each colored band representing millimeters of movement. AI algorithms trained on decades of volcanic data from dozens of calderas worldwide analyzed patterns, searching for signatures that preceded eruptions. The machine learning found similarities to episodes that stabilized without erupting but also similarities to episodes that didn't. In 1895, beneath New Zealand's Lake Topo, something similar happened. Ground swelled, hot springs boiled more vigorously, earthquakes rattled the Maori communities around the lake for months. European settlers new to the land panicked. The indigenous people, whose oral histories remembered catastrophic eruptions, watched with concern but not surprise. The unrest continued for two years, then gradually subsided. No eruption came. The mountain, as the elders said, was breathing but not waking. Italy's Campi Flegre has been rising for decades. The ground beneath Naples, a city of three million built atop a supervolcano, has lifted over three meters since 1950. Authorities have raised and lowered alert levels repeatedly. Evacuations planned, canceled, planned again. Each episode teaches what the next might look like, but guarantees nothing. The residents live with radical uncertainty accepting that the beautiful bay could become something else entirely, possibly tomorrow, possibly never in their lifetimes. Modern monitoring has given us a strange gift. We now see calderas restless, know they're capable of destruction, but can't predict which breath is their last normal one before something changes forever. Indigenous peoples lived near these systems for millennia without seismographs, reading the land through observation and story. 
We have extraordinary data and less certainty. Every earthquake is recorded. Every gas emission is measured. And still we say we don't know more often than anyone wants to hear. By week three, the pattern became clear. Uplift was slowing, not stopping, but decelerating. The exponential curve was bending downward. Seven centimeters in week one, four in week two, two in week three. Seismicity followed the same trajectory, hundreds of events daily declining to dozens. The gas chemistry, initially showing increased magmatic contribution, stabilized. Whatever was happening at depth was losing momentum. But nothing had actually been resolved. The ground stood 24 centimeters higher than before. The pressure source remained active. The deep basalt intrusion, if that's what it was, sat there still, cooling slowly, transmitting residual heat to surrounding formations. The volcano hadn't answered the question everyone wanted answered. Was this a false alarm or a preview? Federal agencies prepared plans they hoped would never activate. FEMA ran scenarios. If major eruption warnings came with six hours notice, how would you evacuate a national park potentially holding 20,000 people? Where do they go when every road leads through potential ashfall zones? How do you communicate danger without causing stampedes? The exercises revealed uncomfortable truths. Some situations have no good options, only choices between different failures. Week five brought the news everyone half expected, half dreaded. Uplift had stopped, seismicity had returned to background levels, the constant low-grade grumbling that's been normal for Yellowstone since monitoring began. Gas emissions remained slightly elevated but stable. The crisis, if it was a crisis, had ended, except it hadn't ended, it had paused. What actually happened? Best guess, a small basaltic intrusion migrated upward, stalled around eight miles down and heated hydrothermal systems above it. Pressure built, the rock fractured, water flashed to steam in confined spaces, the ground rose, then the equilibrium was reached. Pressure found outlets through existing fractures, heat dissipated through convection and conduction. The system vented what it needed to vent and settled into a new temporary balance. But here's the honest assessment. We think that's what happened. The data support it, it matches theoretical models. Similar episodes at other calderas followed comparable patterns but we're interpreting signals from miles underground, trying to diagnose a system we've never seen in its active state, using instruments that have only existed for decades while the system has existed for millions of years. Science progresses through uncertainty acknowledged, not through false confidence. While scientists tracked magma and gas, another community responded to Yellowstone's unrest, the thermophiles, heat-loving bacteria and archaea that inhabit thermal features detected temperature changes faster than any instrument. As ground heat flux increased during October's episode, microbial mats shifted composition. Species thriving at 140 FEF gave way to specialist handling 160. Hot springs changed color not just from mineral chemistry but from biological succession happening in real time, life adapting to a breathing planet. These organisms, some of the most ancient forms of life on Earth, have been riding Yellowstone's thermal pulses for millions of years. They've survived countless unrest episodes. They'll survive the next eruption whenever it comes, flourishing in the aftermath while complex organisms struggle. There's strange comfort in that. Life persists. Not every life, but life. The planet's deepest processes support some of its toughest organisms. Heat that could destroy cities nurtures creatures that don't care about cities. Machine learning is changing volcanic monitoring. Algorithms now process seismic data in real time, identifying patterns humans might miss in the noise. AI trained on decades of global earthquake data detects subtle changes in wave velocities that might indicate magma movement. Computer vision analyses satellite imagery tracking ground deformation and thermal anomalies across entire volcanic fields simultaneously. But AI has the same problem humans do. It learns from the past, and calderas like Yellowstone haven't erupted during the era when we could record data to train algorithms. We're teaching machines to recognize patterns we haven't seen, Meet Tom Reichert, who's run a fly fishing shop in Gardner, Montana for 32 years. During October's unrest, he fielded hundreds of calls from worried clients, many canceling trips. He answered honestly, yes, Yellowstone is active. Yes, monitoring shows changes. No, he's not leaving. I'm probably more at risk driving to Bozeman for supplies than from the volcano, he says. We live with it. Same way people live on coastlines knowing hurricanes come, or in California knowing the ground shakes. The math supports his attitude. Annual probability of dying in a car crash, roughly 1 in 7,000. Annual probability of Yellowstone producing any eruption, roughly 1 in 700,000. The catastrophic super eruption scenario everyone fears, maybe 1 in 70 million per year. We're terrible at intuiting rare risks. We fear what's spectacular, except what's mundane. Tom understands the statistics. He also understands he could be the statistical outlier. He stays anyway.
Yellowstone has been a caldera for 640,000 years. It will remain one for hundreds of thousands more. During that span, it might erupt zero times, it might erupt 20. Human civilization, all recorded history, agriculture, writing, cities and nations fit into the last one-tenth of one per percent of the caldera's existence. We're watching a geological feature that operates on timescales that make human generations look like heartbeats. Expecting it to perform on our schedule, or even to provide us warnings calibrated to human decision-making time spans, is asking the mountain to care about creatures it doesn't know exist. Every year, millions walk above a magma chamber larger than some countries. They photograph geysers powered by the same heat that could, under different conditions, end civilization. They camp above a future eruption site, and this is entirely rational. The probability of eruption during any individual visit is effectively zero. The probability of being enriched by Yellowstone's beauty is guaranteed. We should be grateful for the temporary stability, for the accident of timing that places us in an interlude between cataclysms. The planet offers us a window to witness its power safely. We should take it. Tonight, across Yellowstone, instruments are measuring, seismometers listen for tremors, GPS receivers calculate positions, gas sensors sample chemistry, satellite cameras watch from orbit. And in a control room, someone is reviewing the day's data, looking for anomalies, comparing today's patterns to yesterday's, to last year's, to decades past. The monitoring never stops, the mountain never sleeps, and somewhere between those two truths we live. Will Yellowstone erupt in our lifetime? Almost certainly not. Will it erupt someday? Almost certainly yes. Will we have a warning? Probably. Will the warning be sufficient? Unknown. What should you do with this information? Visit Yellowstone, marvel at it, respect it, Support the scientists who watch it. Understand that living on an active planet means accepting that the ground beneath us is not as solid as it feels. And then live anyway. Because the alternative is to fear something you cannot control, cannot prevent, and statistically will never experience. That's no way to exist. October's episode added another data point to Caldera science. The unprecedented uplift rate expanded what we knew was possible. The peaceful resolution reminded us that escalation isn't inevitable. The monitoring worked. The communication, imperfect but honest, served the public. And the mountain, for now, is quiet again. For now, the ground is 24 centimeters higher than before October. GPS receivers still measure it daily. That elevation gain isn't going away unless the system reverses, which it might or doesn't, which is more likely. Yellowstone now sits at a slightly different baseline. Instruments track every millimeter of subsequent movement, waiting for the next deviation from the new normal. Because there will be another episode, maybe next year, maybe in a century. What did we learn? That rapid deformation doesn't necessarily mean eruption. That calderas can accelerate uplift dramatically and then simply stop. The conversation between magma, water, and rock operates on its own schedule, indifferent to human concerns. We learned again that monitoring provides data but not prophecy. Every episode refines our models. Every episode reminds us that models aren't the mountain. 23 known supervolcano systems exist worldwide. Toba, Topo, Velez, Long Valley, Era, Topo, Campi Flegre. They form a network of potential catastrophes, monitored by international teams sharing data across borders. When Yellowstone showed unusual activity, scientists in Japan and New Zealand paid attention. When Long Valley showed elevated seismicity last year, Yellowstone researchers watched patterns. We're building a global understanding of caldera behavior, one unrest episode at a time. But none of these systems have produced super eruptions during the age of science. We're preparing for events beyond our direct experience. How do you prepare for a VI-8 eruption? The honest answer, you don't. Not adequately. You can evacuate the immediate zone. You can stockpile supplies. You can plan communication protocols. But a true super eruption would eject enough material to bury multiple states, collapse roofs under ash hundreds of miles away, and disrupt the global climate for years. Agriculture would fail across continents. Supply chains would shatter. The social consequences would dwarf the geological ones. No evacuation plan scales to that. You monitor, you hope for precursor warnings. You prepare for what you can manage and accept you can't manage the maximum scenario. Children in Yellowstone Gateway communities grow up with unusual dinner table conversations. They learn about VEI scales and magma chambers the way other kids learn state capitals. When October's episode happened, schools incorporated it into science lessons, turning anxiety into education. Fifth graders made eruption models. High schoolers analyzed real seismic data. The next generation of volcanologists might be sitting in those classrooms. Their career paths shaped by living next to a sleeping giant. Within minutes of the algorithmic alert, Sarah Chen's phone vibrated in Berkeley. 
She'd been tracking Yellowstone's pulse for 15 years, watching its slow dance of expansion and contraction. This wasn't a dance, this was a sprint. By the time her colleagues gathered for an emergency video call at 6 a.m. Pacific, seismometers had recorded over 400 distinct tremors. The earth beneath America's oldest national park was speaking. Whether it was clearing its throat or beginning to scream, no one could yet say. Imagine a reservoir of molten rock the size of Los Angeles, suspended five miles underground. Now imagine a second, deeper pool, large enough to swallow all five Great Lakes, riding the convection currents 20 miles down. This is Yellowstone's beating heart, a plume of superheated material rising from depths where diamonds form, feeding a system that has rewritten North America's geography three times in the past two million years. But here's what makes it dangerous. That massive reservoir isn't liquid. Most of it exists as a crystal porridge, rock just below the melting point. Waiting, scattered through this matrix are pockets of genuine melt, silica-rich magma holding dissolved gases under crushing pressure. Scientists estimate perhaps one part in 20 is actually mobile. That sounds safe until you remember 1 20th of Los Angeles is still enormous, and it only takes a fraction to escape. The last time this system truly emptied itself, humans hadn't yet left Africa. 640,000 years before anyone called this place Yellowstone, the caldera floor dropped a mile as thousands of cubic miles of magma exploded into the stratosphere. Ash buried what's now Kansas under a foot of gray powder. The Mississippi River choked. The climate cooled globally for years. The scar remains, a depression 40 miles across, masked now by forest and water, beautiful and lethal. 